In recent weeks, some research has been published in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports, which shows that the altar stone at Stonehenge did not come from Wales as previously thought. Unlike the other blue stones, it appears to have come from further afield than that. This rather startling update to the Stonehenge enigma coincided with me finally starting to read the monograph Stonehenge for the Ancestors Part 1. Published in 2020, the book is one of four volumes detailing archaeological work carried out as part of the Stonehenge Riverside project between 2003 and 2009. Although I already knew that Stonehenge was built in phases and that it is part of a rich Neolithic and Bronze Age landscape, I'm still learning some incredible things from this book. The sheer complexity of Stonehenge's evolution is astounding, as is the number of other monuments in the area. For several thousand years, the ancients were very industrious, modifying the landscape and building monuments that we still find pretty mystifying today. In this video, I delve into Stonehenge and try to summarize what we know about this incredible and famous site. Stonehenge is widely believed to have been a ritual monument, with its solstitial alignments having significance for the Bronze Age people that built it. However, the monument we see today is relatively recent when we consider that a ceremonial structure was possibly present on the site as far back as 10,000 years ago. Evidence for this comes from four large pits discovered in the old Stonehenge car park to the northwest of the site. Three of these pits held pine posts during the Mesolithic, and all four pits form a straight line. Another shallower pit sits to the southeast. It's possible all these pits and the posts that once existed in some of them form some sort of ritual monument aligned with Beacon Hill. They are all located in a dry valley. Similar Mesolithic pits have been found in other places too. At Warren Field in Aberdeenshire, it's thought the pits held posts and functioned as a lunisolar calendar. I did a video on that site. Mesolithic activity at Stonehenge has been found in the form of flints and bone fragments. However, the quantity of these is low compared to an area over a kilometre to the east where a large Mesolithic site has been found. Archaeologists discovered 40,000 worked flints and 300 animal bones at Blick Mead, close to a spring. So Blick Mead was a pretty significant site for Mesolithic groups who were probably drawn there by the natural spring. Perhaps it was these people working flints at Blick Mead that were involved in building a ritual monument a little way to the west at Stonehenge. Archaeologists have identified five phases of construction at Stonehenge over more than 1,000 years. Keep in mind that I'm going to try to summarize an enormously complex topic. The first phase has been dated to between 3080 and 2950 BCE. During this phase, a circular earthwork enclosure was built and the holes now referred to as the Aubrey holes were dug. These probably held bluestones. In the center of the circular enclosure, there were rectangular structures created at this time and these probably contained sarsen stones. A timber facade was placed at the south entrance and six lines of timber posts were placed at the northeast entrance. Three other holes near the heel stone may date to this first phase and may have held sarsen stones. At this time, the Coneyberry Henge was erected 1.4 kilometers east southeast of Stonehenge. There's evidence that it contained timber structures. The second phase is considered to be between the dates 2740 and 2505 BCE. During that time, the trilithon horseshoe and circle made of sarsens were constructed. A bluestone double circle was set up between them. The four station stones were also erected at this time, and two of them were originally part of mounds now referred to as the North and South Barrows. Although the heel stone may have been erected in phase one, it's also possible this took place in phase two. The altar stone was also set up, as well as the slaughter stone and two sarsen stones that were placed at the north entrance. During the second phase, a late Neolithic settlement was built at the site now referred to as Durrington Walls. Established 2.8 kilometres northeast of Stonehenge, this village was inhabited for more than 100 years. As well as domestic dwellings, it also contained two timber circles known as the Southern and Northern Circles and five henges. The Southern Circle was aligned with the midwinter sunrise. An avenue stretched for 180 metres, aligning with the midsummer sunset and connecting the Southern Circle with the River Avon. Between 2400 and 2220 BCE, 25 bluestones were erected in a 10 metre diameter circle in the centre of Stonehenge. This period is known as phase three. 
A huge pit was dug next to the great trilithon, the sarsen stones next to the slaughter stone were removed, and the enclosure ditch was recut. The avenue existed at this time, but may have been created earlier, stretching for 500 meters in a straight line from the northeast entrance. The avenue then takes a sharp turn east before curving down to meet the river Avon. The first 500 meters are therefore aligned with Stonehenge's midsummer and midwinter solstitial axis. Excavations have found that the earthworks making up the avenue follow natural ridges and gullies known as periglacial stripes. These features were created during the last glacial maximum. Experts think the ancient builders of Stonehenge may have been drawn to the area because these periglacial stripes were aligned with the solstices and the first part of the avenue was then created alongside them for this reason too. During this time, a stone circle consisting of 25 blue stones at the end of the avenue was dismantled and a 30 meter diameter henge and bank was created around where it had been. The henge is now referred to as the West Ainsbury Henge or Bluestone Henge. During phase four between 2210 and 2030 BCE, the blue stones were reconfigured as an oval inside the trilithon horseshoe and an outer circle. This oval was then converted to a horseshoe layout at a later time. The avenue's ditch was also recut. Between 1980 and 1745 BC, two concentric circles of pits known as the Y and Z holes were dug outside the Sarsen Circle. This period is known as Phase 5. The blue stones used to build part of Stonehenge, as well as the stone circle that formerly existed on the edge of the River Avon, originated from Wales, with the majority coming from the Priscelli Hills. Bluestone is the name given to a number of different types of rock, including spotted dolerite, dolerite, rhyolite, volcanics, and sandstone. Experts have identified that the Stonehenge bluestones came from quarries at a place called Craig Ross y Felin in the Priscelli Hills, and that before being transported to Salisbury Plain, they were part of a large stone circle at Warren Morn close by. Here are two scattered megaliths that are thought to have formed part of the original circle. Research shows that the circle's diameter was roughly 110 meters. Four stones are still present, one standing and three lying down. There's also another standing stone nearby that's now known as the Worn Morn Stone and measures 2.3 meters in height. Archaeologists found a socket where a pentagonal shaped stone would have been placed and this matches a similarly shaped one at Stonehenge, lending weight to the idea that it had been moved from Wales to the Salisbury Plain. Optically stimulated luminescence dating places the construction of this circle to between 3400 and 3200 BCE before being dismantled sometime before 2120 BCE. This discovery refuted the idea that the bluestones had been transported to Salisbury Plain as glacial erratics, putting human agency behind the whole process. In Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britannae, he says that the legendary magician Merlin took the stones of the giant's dance in Ireland to Stonehenge, Although much of his work is thought to be based on a combination of historical sources and mythology, it's interesting that this transportation of the stones was mentioned and that now, although not Ireland, the stones of Stonehenge can be traced to Wales. The monograph discusses how the altar stone, a blue stone, was sourced from the Brecon region of South Wales. However, an article recently published in the Journal of Archaeological Science reports details a new analysis of the altar stone using X-ray fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy. This study found that the mineralogy of the altar stone does not match the sandstones in Wales where it was thought to have originated from. In fact, the concentrations of barite mean it may have been sourced from much further away, with Cumbria, Orkney and Shetland all being tantalising possibilities. The paper is not freely accessible, but there are a number of articles summarising the results of the study, and part of me really wants the old stone to have originated in Orkney. I imagine Orkney is a megalithic hub, inspiring the next generation to spread whatever knowledge is encoded in their stone monuments across Britain. Of course, we don't actually know what Stonehenge was used for. In 2022, archaeologist Timothy Darville published a paper in the journal Antiquity suggesting that Stonehenge was actually a detailed calendar. It's long been known that Stonehenge's southwest and northeast axis aligns with the solstices, but Darville argued that construction related to phase two created a perpetual calendar for a tropical solar year of 365.25 days. It's thought there were 30 sarsen stones originally. 
Darvel thinks the space in between them indicates that they were divided into groups of ten, or deacons. Each upright represented a day, and each deacon represented a week of ten days, meaning a month had three weeks of ten days in it. If the thirty uprights were then multiplied by twelve, they produced 360 solar days. The five trilithons inside the circle, which form a horseshoe shape, would then have represented the five missing or epigomenal days. Since another day needs adding once every four years to account for the extra quarter day, Darvall then suggests that the four station stones, of which two remain, may have been a way of tracking this extra day. Intriguingly, Darvall also doesn't rule out that this calendar had a Mediterranean origin, since it's known that the ancient Egyptians had a 365-day solar calendar during the 3rd millennium BCE. They also separated the year into 12 months of 30 days, split into 3 weeks of 10 days, and had an intercalary month of five days. In the same year, astronomers Giulio Mali and Juan Antonio Belmonte published a counter-argument to this hypothesis in the same journal. They brought up the point that no such calendar existed in the Bronze Age, since it didn't evolve to that level of complexity until the Ptolemaic period in Egypt. In ancient Egypt, the calendar consisted of 365 days, and is often referred to as a wandering calendar because of its inaccuracy, as it didn't take into account the quarter day. The authors also argue that the number 12, which the 30 upright stones need to be multiplied by in order to mark a solar year, does not appear anywhere in the complex. There's also no obvious device that could have been used to signify which upright stone in the circle represented which day, which trilithon tracked which epigominal day, or which station stone represented which quarter day. Mali and Belmonte also point out that other numbers are missed altogether in support of this hypothesis, such as the number of stones making up the trilithons. With regards to the solstitial alignments, the authors say, and I quote, the sarsen phase solstitial axis is not accurate in time because of the minuscule difference between the sunrise and sunset position for several days by either side of either solstice. So while the existence of the axis can be taken to demonstrate a calendrical function in the very broad sense, the mere existence of the solstitial axis provides no proof whatsoever for inferring that the builders counted the days in the year and conceived it as comprising a set number of days, be that 360, 365, or 365.25. The authors also cast doubt on what the original sarsen stone structures may have looked like. Personally, I do think archaeoastronomy and calendars were reflected in ancient megalithic monuments, but I'm not sure exactly how. I think they went beyond solstitial and equinoctial alignments, though. Darvall's hypothesis is an interesting one, but it pretty much only applies to phase two of Stonehenge and the stones themselves. What about the structures, stone, timber, and earthen, that were built both earlier and later? If it was meant to be a solar calendar, then surely we would see a gradual refinement of a rudimentary concept over the years. I think we put too much emphasis on solar alignments, when lunar and stellar alignments were probably really important to the ancients too. If the ancients were mostly preoccupied with monitoring the seasons for agriculture or planning, then I can imagine understanding the solar year was vital to survival. Therefore, monuments would have been built to not only track it, but also to enact rituals dedicated to it. But since we don't know what sort of religion Neolithic cultures had, there's every reason to think they had complex cosmological ideas, probably including stellar and lunar phenomena as well, and some of this passed down to later civilizations such as ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. There are many other notable ancient monuments in the vicinity of Stonehenge. I mentioned a few when discussing the various phases of the monument, Blue Stonehenge, the Durrington Walls, and Cornbury Henge. Just as at many other megalithic sites, Kursuses were built nearby. The Greater Kursus was created 700 meters north of Stonehenge. This rectangular earthen enclosure measured 2.8 kilometers in length and 150 meters in width and was oriented from east to west. An antelopic excavated within it was dated to between 3630 and 3370 BC, so earlier than Stonehenge. Other Kursuses in Britain have also been dated to earlier than the stone monuments they are built close to, so the original relationship between them isn't clear. Dating to around the same period as the Greater Kursus is the Lesser Kursus, two kilometres west-northwest of Stonehenge. Measuring 400 metres in length and 60 metres in width, it was originally half the size before being extended. Rather than remaining as a full enclosure, its east side was left open when it was enlarged. The site known as Durrington Walls refers to a late Neolithic settlement comprising houses 
two large timber circles called the southern and northern circles, five small henges and a 180 meter long avenue connecting the southern circle to the river Avon. Two of the small henges were built around houses, domestic dwellings, which is interesting. Towards the end of habitation, a timber circle was built around the settlement, followed by a henge with a diameter of 400 metres. In 2020, the Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes project revealed 20 massive pits, measuring 20 metres in diameter and 5 metres or more in depth, forming a penannular ring with a 2 kilometre diameter around the site. This means the pits form one of the largest prehistoric structures in Britain. Close to Durrington Walls, a late Neolithic timber circle and henge measuring 100 metres in diameter was identified early in the 20th century. It's now known as Woodhenge. The timber posts were erected earlier than the henge. An early Neolithic pit, which has been named the Combry Anomaly, was found 1.4 kilometres east-southeast of Stonehenge. Dated to between 3760 and 3700 BCE, the pit was full of pottery sherds and the bones of cattle, deer and pigs. Experts think it suggests a feasting event took place there. Archaeologists have also found evidence for other monuments within the Stonehenge landscape, including scattered megaliths, causewayed enclosures, timber structures, henges and long barrows. These all date between the early Neolithic and early Bronze Age, so we are definitely looking at a dense ritual landscape. Even if there were practical reasons for all these structures, the sheer effort that would have gone into building them at a time when survival was difficult and the main priority, shows that there must have been other reasons as well for such an intensive undertaking. This landscape is repeated throughout Britain, where Neolithic and Bronze Age structures run into their thousands overall. Considering the similarity between all the structures and the fact that stones were transported vast distances, it seems clear to me that the groups living in Britain in ancient times were connected in some way. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a vastly complex subject which I will keep returning to. Don't forget to hit the like button if you haven't already. Thank you to my patrons and channel members and I'll catch up with you next time.